Good morning, everybody, and uh, thank you for coming back after being all over the world. It was amazing. It always is amazing to see how this topic brings people from everywhere to share wisdom on how we can help to untangle some of the world's conflicts, how we can build peace, how we can nurture peace, or whatever metaphors we use. Um, I made the mistake a few years ago of writing this article called Just Wasting Our Time. And since then, I have been plagued by people saying, well, are we or aren't we? And uh, Pascal was the last one, actually, last night. He said, you are going to tell us the answer. So I said to him, no, you know, all good educators just ask better questions. But maybe we do need to try to think more clearly about what this question raises for us. I haven't got a PowerPoint for you. I'm so sorry. So you'll have to listen. Uh, I'm going to talk for very roughly quarter of three, <laughs> three quarters of an hour, but I will go quite slowly. And my suggestion is that you try and maintain your attention until that's finished, and then we have some points of clarification. Then our thinking is that we will break into small groups for about an hour. We will take our tea, and uh, you will digest some of what's been put out there for you. You will think to yourselves, does this relate to what my experience? And then we will come back for the last three quarters of an hour and share some of our thinking around this topic. So that's the shape of it, a talk, some group work in the garden, some reflection together again, uh, which Tanya will lead us in, and we will end around 12, is that correct? Inshallah. So I have a dilemma. I hate using notes, and yet I know that I am better and more focused if I do. So I've got them here, and I will pretty well stick to them. Uh, but occasionally I will deviate. So if I get tedious, just ring your, put your hand up and I'll tell you a joke. <laughs> so in this original article, uh, Just Wasting Our Time, I wrote it with Lada Zimina and we were looking at the experience that we had had over 20, 30 years. And I was saying to her at one point, I've just had enough of fighting for lost causes all my life. And that's how we got talking about this field and are we doing anything useful. So what I want to do today is very briefly touch on what we tried to say in that article for all of you who haven't yet re read it and why should you. Then I want to explore a little bit um, what, what I did was, I, I've been working, and I'm currently working in Zimbabwe. Uh, and I've been, part of what I'm trying to do is to apply these ideas that we work with in a pretty difficult situation. And I want to look at that a little bit and share with you some of the reflections that I've had about whether we're wasting our time or not. In, the con in that context, and then come out and say to you, well, does this touch your experience? So it's a little bit of almost like a, a laboratory, if you like, though I would never want to treat Zimbabwe like a, a laboratory. It's far too risky for that. And then uh, that, will, that will sort of see us through, I think. So I hope that what we're doing this morning will feed into the discussions we're having about managing peace and evaluation. If you like, it's trying to paint the bigger, broader picture in which we're working. And sometimes in evaluation and peace building, we tend to not look at the bigger picture for fairly obvious reasons. So going then to this first little section that I want to share with you, what we tried to say in the original article. In fact, the original title was, Are We Just Nice People Wasting Our Time? And when Berkhoff got their hands on it, they took off the nice people, and they just called it, uh, Just Wasting Our Time, Provocative Thoughts for Peace Builders. 
And funnily enough, I think the nice people bit is quite important. And I'll come back to this later. I think it may be one of our problems that we're too nice and we're up against people who are pretty nasty. I mean, deep down, I'm sure they're nice. Um, and we are nasty, actually. <laughs> but the, the configuration at the moment is, I think, sometimes we are rather nice, rather too nice for the task we've set ourselves. So in the article, we took the position that while collectively we have achieved a lot, there are critical factors that are holding us back. So when we were looking at the things we have achieved, we noticed things like the methodologies for training and learning, which are quite special, the opportunities for capacity building in education, there's a lot, a lot of fast developing research-based theory, a lot of grassroots initiatives, many centers of excellence for research and lobbying, civil society as a source of innovation, mass non-violent movements for regime change, effective global networking, and the way that some of this has percolated up to government lev level and intergovernment level. But it's come at a huge cost. I think it's come at a huge cost. In the article, we pointed to a lack of a shared vision and values. And we pointed to the way that many organizations committed to peace building are very deferential to power. We scrape in the face of people with power, whoever they are, and we are divided by rivalries. And we talked about the way that the role of funding bends our work in directions which may not relate to the peace that we actually wanted to build when we entered this area. And we ended, or almost, with this paragraph, which says, in turning away from its core transformative values and rejecting a wholehearted engagement with power and politics, peace building has found the resources necessary to develop institutionally, and it's gained a measure of, of official acceptance. But in so doing, perhaps it has lost much of the raison d'etre which brought it into existence. If the future of peace building is to provide technical expertise to help powerful states and corporations assert their dominance in the global system, in the short term, this is an easier choice for us to make, maybe. But in the long run, this stance will not stand up to scrutiny because the resources of the world are depleting and as we can see the, the, the environment in, where, in which we're working is, is crumbling in many ways. So I'm suggesting we've got on a horse which has taken us in a direction we thought we wanted to go but that horse is now taking us way beyond and we're losing sight of it because we like to have big organizations with big budgets for projects and so on. So the question we raised was whose agenda are we working to and whose peace are we striving for? My current work is in Zimbabwe and I'm now moving to the second section of what I want to say which is to look briefly at the situation in Zimbabwe and what and some conclusions and thoughts that are coming out of trying these ideas in that context. Why Zimbabwe? Because I've lived and worked there on and off for about 30 or 40 years. Uh, so I feel it's a, a home. It isn't a strange place for me. But it's also a place where unlike, no, like many other places, uh, things are extraordinarily difficult. It's possible to be hopeful in Zimbabwe but not really optimistic, if you see what I mean. There is a difference, isn't there? We can, we can look at our philosophies later. So what's Zimbabwe like? In a nutshell, uh, Zimbabwe has cascaded downhill in every index imaginable in the last 10 years. Three years ago, its inflation rate was in the trillions, and I brought with me uh, this is a hundred billion dollar note. 
and I remember going, uh, it was three years ago now, I remember buying a loaf of bread with this and getting 20, how many? <laughs> I can't remember. I got a bit of change, but not much out of $100 million. So, you know, that devastates a country and it's had its influence all over. So from a relatively rich country, it is now, for most people, a desperately poor country. But funnily enough, it is one of the richest in terms of minerals because it has diamonds, platinum, gold, gas, coal. You can go on naming. It's probably one of the richest countries in terms of per head minerals under the ground. Uh, but the gangster regime is simply taking them all away in suitcases and storing them in different parts of the world and the population does not see any of it. And even when MPs want to visit the areas like the diamond areas, they're not allowed to visit for national security reasons. So it's a, it's a country that's run by a military junta and headed by a president whose mind is going as well as his body. In fact, the other day Mugabe gave his condolences to South Africa for the death of Mandela. This was a mistake. And he did it twice before realizing that it was a mistake. So that's an indication of A, his hopes, no doubt, because he's always seen himself as a rival. Uh, but more, I think, to a, a failing brain. And uh, that's got its cost for the, for the whole country. And into all of that, there have been a lot of deaths over the last 20, 30 years which have been undealt with. So there's massive grievance in this country, which is undealt with. So into this situation, I'm working in two areas, on livelihoods and also on what we're calling peace building and conflict transformation. And I think first thing, I now want to move to, to what I've found in our field, which has really been positive. And then I want to come to some of the questions. So in terms of the positives, one of the things I found is that people are really interested in our field. They want to come to events if we hold them. They are fascinated by the, some of our ideas, which for us seem like pretty ordinary ideas, but the difference between positions and needs. Empathy. The idea of win-win, mediation as a process which is owned by the parties rather than arbitration. Participative analysis, all of those are really exciting for many people and I guess this is also true for yourselves. People love it and, and, and that's good. It's useful and it, it means that this subject has status. And that's been important because I've found that one of the ways in for using this field is as in training as intervention. Because it's seen as a professionalizing tool. So the police, the army, the prisons, the spies. I had a whole day with the spy service. <laughs> At the same time as I had no uh, job permission. Uh, really unbelievable. Um, they didn't come back for the second day, because <laughs> you can't. Actually, one did. He came back and he said, where are all the others? I said, no, they haven't. He said, oh, God, I shouldn't be here. <laughs> like spies, they should never actually be there. Um, so I think that's, and I, I won't go into detail, but I think I, one of the entry points that has been really useful is working with the security sector around these ideas with their agenda and trusting that in, in so far as we can provide the spaces for people to do this thinking and we make it confidential, they can do their own processing and their own thinking about what needs to happen. Of course, you can't inquire in that situation, but you can give them the opportunity. And I have found in, in some situations, in some communities, places where they've really adopted these ideas, and I say adopted is completely the wrong word because, of course, many of them have found it from their own resources. But their approach to peace and conflict echoes our own. And uh, in one amazing place, I found the Working with Conflict book, which they had used.
develop their own, completely their own, and, and hugely better. <coughs> and you know, those are, those are very exciting moments. And um, it led me to think that in many ways what we're doing does, does work in confined spaces and where the, the intentions and the leadership are fairly coherent and, and uh, defined. But I think, and this is where I'm coming to the buts, if you like, I've touched on some of the, the things that I think are positive about our field, and we could look at those more. Um, but I, I am asking this question about, uh, you know, are we being useful? And I think there's a couple of things that have really come on me as being serious gaps, which not only influence our practice, but also influence in terms of this conference, how we evaluate, is this working or is this not? Where's my vodka? I want to then come to this question of upstream, what I'm calling upstream, looking back upwards to where our funding and our money comes from. Part of the background noise in Zimbabwe is always the propaganda that NGOs are about regime change. It's all of them, humanitarian, environmental, democracy, all those things. Now in one sense, of course, it must be wrong because I don't think, certainly the internationals are not there to change a regime. But I've begun to think a lot more about why people can say this with such conviction. And I think it, in part, it does have a grain of truth in it. If we're brutally honest with ourselves, it's not difficult to see how we can be viewed as instruments of Western influence. After all, who funds us? It's the European Union, it's the US, and we know what their futures are, their, their views are on the future of countries like Zimbabwe. And I think this is something we're quite familiar with, probably. We know that, that, that we're funded by, by people, and we're hoped by people who may not share our views, but we also, I think, tend to hope that we can preserve our own agendas and, and somehow do what we need within what USAID or the EU or the other big funders want. But I think the, pressing, the, the question becomes more pressing for us because <coughs> when we look at the behavior, the global behavior of the powers who fund peace building, we don't just find that they're market driven, they're actually warmongers. Uh, Simon Jenkins in the London Guardian, is it London? Somewhere, Guardian, wrote recently, why do we still go to war? We seem unable to stop. We find any excuse for this post-imperial fidget. <laughs> and yet we keep getting trapped. Britain's borders and British people have not been under serious threat for a generation. Yet time and again our leaders crave battle. Why? Well, we're a little country, but then if you look at the US, uh, a, a colleague of ours, Jake Lynch, professor, uh, of, um, a professor at the Center for Peace and Conflict Studies at the University of Sydney, who works on peace journalism, has calculated that since Pearl Harbor, anyone alive at the time of Pearl Harbor? <laughs> Nobody admitting it. But we all know when it was, don't we? 1941. Since then, the United States has, has spent more years at war than at peace. So he's saying that the US, and I'm quoting him, the US has now switched to a country whose normal state is to be at war and a condition that is likely to continue into the foreseeable future. There was a recent study that came out from Brown University in the US, very recent, the last two or three months, estimated that the US wars in Afghanistan and Iraq together will cost four trillion dollars and something like 225,000 people will die as a result, civilians and soldiers. That's a lot of people. 
and 550,000 people will have disability claims as a result, and 8 million will be displaced. If you look at Britain, my own country sometimes, the calculation that each, each time they drop a Tomahawk missile, which they do every day, and they've had to get some more from the Americans because they've, they've run out of theirs, each one is the equivalent of a hospital ward and a school classroom. So I, I think the question for us is why is this happening when Western nations don't face any serious threat to their integrity? So my suggestion is it's not democracy that's driving this. There's a system which is around the needs of armies and, and um, all the complexities that go around that. It's driven to a large extent by global corporations who now do the weapon selling, then they do the fighting, and then they do the reconstruction afterwards. It's a wonderful business, huge business. <laughs> So those of us who were alive in 1961, which is still more recent, we might remember Eisenhower warning people about the military-industrial complex, which was forming the policy of the country increasingly. And if he saw now where we are, I think he would be able to pat himself on the back and say, I told you so. So I, what I want to put out there for us is that things are upstream our water is pretty contaminated. Why is this peace building money coming? I'm not saying it's all coming from the people who are making war, but it's all coming from people who acquiesce in that, even if they don't actually do it. I think if you look, you can see that there is opposition. Uh, there was a, a British minister recently who was quoted as saying, it's getting increasingly difficult to wage war. Why? First, the decline of deference and the growth in mistrust of those in authority which challenge government and decision-making by the military. So there's decline of deference. Then, the 24-7 media, which demands a different kind of communication from the government. And thirdly, he pointed to a freedom of information culture which asserts that everything known to, known to the state should be in the public domain, like all those leaks that have happened in recent months and years. So it's good that the ministers are finding it more and more difficult to go to war. And if you look at the opposition across the world to the way that Libya has been bombed, you can also see that there is... It's not as though the system has it all to itself. But my question is, where are we in this? Do we raise our voices? Do we question all of this? Or do we simply take the money and run? I'm reminded of the Sufi story of a man who is, why is it a man? Because it was. Who is walking in the street on a very dark night and he drops the keys to his house. He goes over to the other side of the street where there's a street lamp and he searches under the lamp for the keys. A passerby who's been watching him says to him, why, dear friend, are you looking under the light? Surely you dropped your keys over there somewhere in the dark. And the man says, I know, but it's too dark over there, I can't see. So my question to us here is, have we as a movement, a community, lost sight of a key strand in the original vision for peace work, which dates back almost to Pearl Harbor, and beyond actually. That of a world which is free of violence and exploitation and war. Are we at risk, instead of going back on our tracks to, riot, to try to rediscover the relevance of that vision for today, and to evaluate our progress in that context? Are we at risk of taking the easier course that is, of assessing our work in the light of the clear and well-funded roles we've carved out for ourselves, with a lot of help from nice people with money on the other side of the street. Well, responding to government propaganda in Zimbabwe has taken me a little way, as you can see. And it's uncomfortable territory, I think. I find it uncomfortable.
And I'm not surprised that other people can see us as agents of Western imperialism. And I would really like to explore with you while we're here whether what I've said stands up at all, because it may not be. It may not be valid. But if it does, then what might be a response from us on that? Okay, so that's... Are you still with it? How are people? Do I see any noddings? Um, well, where we've got to is that I've, I've suggested that if we look upstream, we see that our water is pretty contaminated, and maybe that's nothing new, but I'm suggesting we do need to look at that again in the way that war fighting has become such a key part of the economies which also support us as peace builders. So I want now to just take a little time to look downstream. Now I want to look more at the work that we're doing. And I'm concerned, as I've applied some of this within the Zimbabwean context, particularly about the way that we find it difficulty, difficulty in dealing with situations which are one-sided or very dominated by a powerful group, by political repression, if you like, where there's an acute uh, imbalance of power. And I think we seem to have a somewhat disabling preoccupation with consensus. We love consensus. We love people coming together and talking together and getting over their differences. But what if some of us are there deliberately to undermine the others? What if some of us are coming with an agenda which is hidden, which is served by being in the group with lots of other people? How open are we to finding other, more tougher ways of dealing with this? Now, there are obviously some potential connections between what I've described as the upstream and the downstream. For example, many of the funders some of the funders that give us money require us to provide information on who we work with. We're not allowed to work with terrorist organizations, and if we do, they like to know all about it. So there are some fairly connect, direct connections. I don't know about the others, and I'd be interested if you want to explore those. But I think what I'm talking about goes beyond that, actually. It's coming from a different place. In the past year, I've received serious offers of collaboration from two international peace-building organizations. One is, save, no it isn't, Search for Common Ground. Search for Common Ground is really interested in coming to Zimbabwe. The silence is that I'm aware there's the cameras and I know John Marks quite well. <laughs> but what astonished me is that they came with their own very clear framework and agenda which was not negotiable. So John wrote, our job is to encourage moderation, to defuse extremism and to find agreement between and among the parties, even if one party or another acts in a despicable way. The bottom line is, can you work to transform the conflict in Zimbabwe without insisting as a precondition that the playing field be leveled or that certain policies be changed? The framework, our framework, he wrote, is not negotiable. We are not a human rights group. I think I must have written something which provoked that. Fighting for justice for one side in a conflict is not what we do. Our work is to try to find agreement between the parties, blah, blah, blah. This may seem hopeless, dot, dot, dot. Our commitment is to finding common ground, not to advancing the position of one of the parties, no matter how right that party might be. And this really impressed me hugely with well, first of all, I could see that in the context we're working in, that simply is not on. It's too, it's too risky for people to come into a forum with the very powerful and the very weak. 
to try to tr speak truth across, and, and it's impossible to turn your gaze away from the fact that's what's going to happen to the weaker parties when they've gone. They'll be beaten up, taken to prison, and possibly just disappear. And what struck me also was that the existence of more locally adapted existing processes was discounted. We have something here which we will apply. And we're not interested in what's gone before. So I'm wondering, in my mind, does this organization, it must be the biggest, I think, perhaps, in our field doing conflict transformation, does this say something about our field? And then there's another approach from something calling itself the global peace building strategy. I guess some of you will have come across this as you will have done with um, Search for Common Ground. This is a, a, an initiative to build infrastructures for peace across the world. Well, great, so they're writing to Zimbabwe saying, uh, we think it'd be a really great place to take part. So, consulting with Zimbabweans, I write back and say, yeah, tell us more. And then it's explained that a national infrastructure for peace requires a cooperative, problem-solving approach to conflict based on dialogue and non-violence, and the development of institutional mechanisms which promote and manage this approach at local, regional, and national levels. And then he went on to explain how it was really important that this infrastructure had a government unit, ministry, or department for peace building, an enabling bill on infrastructure, and peace education as part of the national education system. Well, do you see what I'm saying? Again, we've got this sense of consensus, and I'm sure it exists in, in different parts of the world, but an implication that government is about the same thing as ordinary people. I'll stick with that phrase. And when I shared this with colleagues, they felt that this was not going to be either possible or really desirable. What do you do when the government is the major instigator of violence? They are the perpetrators. They're in control. Peace itself is regarded as a regime change agenda. So we wrote back and said, well, this is a great idea, but what about a bottom-up process where, where government is not going to play ball? Could we imagine something much more stealth-based, which is still aiming for the same thing but doesn't use the same words? I can see nods, because you, you know what I'm trying to say here. Not only, well, there was nothing, no response. In fact, the same good friend of mine, Paul Van Tongeren, wrote only last week and said, we've heard nothing from Zimbabwe, please, we would like you on board. And again, I wrote back and saying, this is a different scene, but what about a different model? But nothing, no dialogue, nothing coming back. It feels like that these, these, both of these initiatives that I've mentioned are well-funded global initiatives for peace. They're part of our constituency. But I think they reflect an assumption which is quite widespread, that peace is what everybody really wants, from government to grassroots, and they just don't know quite how to get there. And we have some tools which can help them. And I, I, I do think this, is, this must be true of some situations. But my point here is to raise the question of how relevant this is to situations where there is a real imbalance of power, where there is institutionalized repression. And I think if we think and look at the world as it is, even in so-called developed, rich, peaceful countries, we will find communities where this exists where there is pretty ruthless use of power to maintain dominance. And what do we have to say in those situations? Or do we move away and say, well, it's not quite our scene? And I'm wondering whether this isn't somehow where we come to the difference between conflict resolution and conflict transformation. That Conflict, resol conflict resolution can reasonably say our approach only works in certain situations. Clearly defined. And those organizations I've mentioned do it. But if we are aiming to transform deeply entrenched conflicts, 
which is the full-blown conflict transformation position, then we are committed to working in situations which are characterized by asymmetric power relationships. And we need to go deeper into more risky terrain so that finally conflict resolution might become more possible or conflict management. So what I've done now is just to try to raise questions about when we're on the ground, the extent to which we are dependent on consensus and the extent to which we are able to work in situations where we may not be wanted, where it's dangerous to work. And many of us are in that situation here. I know, it's not special to wherever I'm working. It's absolutely true of a lot of places. And the thing is, it gets riskier the more we come to identify the fact that there isn't really consensus on some of the critical things. Whose piece is it? There isn't consensus on that. And I have a nasty feeling that governments and people are never on the same side. Yeah, I'll stand with that, never. So where these inclusive processes may be necessary for, to get to another stage, but I would hate us to think for a moment that somehow in, in the state of the world as it is, when government and people are all together for peace, I would hate us to imagine that, that we've dealt with the crucial questions, because it will tend to be the government's peace. Okay, well, I, I want just, if you're still there with me, I want to just indicate three areas where I think we, we are particularly in need of developing some new thinking, if we're going to be serious about working in, in these difficult areas. And one is, I think we need to work harder at how to resist and subvert the ruthless use of power. Now, actually, I think the ruthless use of power is somebody who talks on and on and on. <laughs> However, I think sometimes power can be used ruthlessly for a benevolent end, like in a talk. But please raise, are you okay at the moment? Is, is, are people still with it? Okay, I think we've got about another 15 minutes of where I want to put things. All right. So, resisting and subverting the ruthless use of power. Some of the most fruitful, enjoyable work that I've been involved in recently has been with young women who Every time they go to get firewood, get sexually abused by men who wait for them and then extract that as a punishment, as a, as a, not a punishment, as a fee, because they don't have any money for the firewood. And without it, as the electricity system has collapsed, they can't eat, they can't cook. I've also been working with groups who are trying to resist political parties who come into the community, <coughs> intimidate people, demand that they buy cards, take them to political rallies, you know, that sort of thing. Now, I, th I think that's one of the entry points for our work. And when I say I, I just have to say that I'm working with a team, with teams of people, and I'm not out there for a whole lot of the time at all, but it, it's the team that we're working with together addresses these issues. But for conflict transformation, this is way off our screen, I think. We're into non-violence, community organizing, those sorts of things. I don't think habitually we as conflict managers, conflict transformers, think of that as part of our scene. So I, I think one of the areas we need to get much more into is understanding how people resist. Um, and when they do, uh, how they can resist effectively. So in Zimbabwe recently, there was a very powerful example where the whole community had, 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 had got whistles for themselves. And when the thugs arrived, as they do, sent in in order to beat up people and intimidate them and tell them they have to vote for the other way, they all blew their whistles and they chased the thugs away. Brilliant. So the next stage is they grabbed the leaders 
of the thugs and took them to the police. Ho ho, but what happens? And you all know the answer. The police arrest the people who've brought the thugs and the thugs are sent empty away, so to speak, with a with little handshake and well done, because, of course, the police are on the other side. So there are plenty of resistance, but I think we have some input to make about helping people where they want think more strategically about how to resist and to come out at least with what you wanted, rather than to end up, as they did, with a, a big defeat, in fact. If we did take power issues seriously, what would we be doing? I think we would be researching the many effects of long-term repression, social, psychological, cultural. Developing our knowledge of ways to resist and undermine these. We'd be looking at how groups resist and the very specific challenges those groups face. What organizational models do they have? What psychological and physical space is there to create different models? I think we'd be developing closer links with nonviolence activists, with human rights people, and maybe we are. And this is very much what I want to, I hope we will draw out from here. We'd be studying how to weaken the power of the power holders as well as how to strengthen the grassroots. So that's one area I'd like to put on the table for you. The second is psychosocial factors. How can we help people with deep fear and justified fear? I mean justified, not unjustified. Justified fear because of what might happen and a sense of powerlessness. How do we work in those situations? How do we help people dissolve the layers of internalized oppression? which are so strong they might as well be metal around their feet and their ears and their hands. Where I'm working and no doubt where many places where you are, this leads to a culture of silence. No one speaks publicly about the rapes, the murders and the theft being committed. And it's, you're almost in a surreal world where the terrible things that are happening are not mentioned. And yet there are smiles on people's faces. This affects everyone, so in my work I can't say the following words, democracy, human rights, change, security sector reform, <coughs> land. Any of those gets me packed off. Uh, and uh, there's, so there's a code about what you can say and what you can't. But then you're thinking, at what point, if I've ditched these words, am I actually not working with a real agenda at all. If I've sold myself for terminology, have I in fact lost the edge? Each compromise one makes, the contribution to this culture of compliance and silence, we lose a bit of the edge, which I think we need. And I th this culture of silence is also bound up with the, with the need for psychosocial healing. People are too affected to, uh, by what's happened to be able to move on. And they can't easily talk about what's happened, especially where impunity prevails. So how seriously do we in conflict transformation take this? Do we assume that people are on the whole uh, uh, mentally healthy? Do we assume they can take rational decisions, ourselves in these situations included? Or do we need to do more thinking about processes that have to be bound up with conflict management and transformation, which are about healing? Third and last element in this that I think we really need to look at, and, and arising from my own current experience, is uh, civil society dynamics. With us, in Zimbabwe, civil society has become a mirror image of the regime. Many of the largest and most relevant NGOs, human rights, counseling, nonviolent resistance, are run by tyrants, white and black. One of them, running the biggest counseling organization, 
has a computer which controls, she can observe what everybody else is doing at any moment in their office on her computer. She can read their emails, and she does. She sent the whole staff to have an hour with a psychiatrist recently, and then fired some of them <laughs> because of what came out in, this, in the interview. And this is astonishing behavior. Yeah. Did she? Oh, no, no, of course not. <laughs> she also keeps an $80,000 car at home, although it's part of an international contract. Now, she's not exceptional. Uh, just one more example. Uh, there's a, an MP who founded an organization on civic education, funded by a German organization who shall be nameless here, in order to get him to leave, which he does need to because he's, for all sorts of reasons, the organization does not need this man, they have had to pay him off with two cars and $20,000. And this is from a European church-based organization in Germany. So we've got massive corruption and autocracy and collusion with outside funders. And the funders, of course, they need projects. Of course, funders need, and they don't want to lose them, and they don't want scandal. So somehow, we've got a, a kind of cycle which goes from community to local NGO to funder or international NGO, all of whom have a kind of interest in saying it's fine. We're evaluated and it's working fine. So whose interest is it to prick the bubble and say, but is it really fine? Are you really evaluating? It's quite a, quite a testing question, I think. So in our situation, where civil society is not mirroring the regime, it tends to be in escapist activities. It does peace building in communities which are not particularly polarized or divided. It does jolly good dialogue work, and you know, it looks great in the project proposal because the people don't really know what communities are, are, are at the forefront or in real difficulty. And they manage to do a lot of peace building, but it doesn't connect. It doesn't connect to the bigger picture. And I think it's not helped by the fact that international NGOs don't want to work in a country where they're not welcome. And which country is going to welcome a peace organization? Well, a lot of us, a lot of them are not. So I think the way that civil society takes this issue on, both locally and internationally, is a question. I'm not, I'm not asking for perfection, believe me. I mean, I'm just indicating some things which are challenges for us uh, and, and wanting to get some kind of echo whether this is a real area uh, for us. We can't do everything, but maybe we need to take account of some of these more when we are undertaking pieces of work, when we are evaluating too. So, what am I saying here? I, I think I'm saying that we need conflict transformation processes because so many of the situations we find ourselves are intractable where power is being used ruthlessly. But it's a very complex and strategic exercise. Conflict transformation requires very different skills and aptitudes from conflict management or conflict resolution. I think I've only really understood this in the last couple of years. That conflict resolution, we know what we're doing. We do mediation, we do negotiation, we do ceasefires, we do violence monitoring and prevention, we do early warning, even if it doesn't lead to early action. We do conflict sensitive approaches. Collectively, we know how to do these things. And we know when we've done them, and we know if we've done them well or not. Hurrah! But in the situations that I'm trying to reach out to, those, that's not enough in a sense. That's the technicality I've been talking about. What about the rest of this stuff? How do we do the more far-reaching analysis that conflict transformation can offer? 
And that's got to include psychological aspects, social psychological, historical, economic, political, environmental, my headaches now, cultural. And when we come to strategies, if we're serious about our triangles, about the context and the culture and, and the behavior, we need to be thinking about education, human rights, transitional justice, environmental protection, trauma healing, development, I'm giving you headaches now. Income generation, politics, economics, active non-violence. I mean, it's huge, isn't it? I mean, it's huge. All of which may be constituents for building a good society. So, I think in practice to transform any entrenched <laughs> conflict requires the ability to range, to mobilize a range of forces. Um, some of you will have read Lederach's book, The, the Heart, and, Heart and Soul of Conflict Transformation, where he talks about social yeast. Our question, he says, our question should be who, though not like-minded or like-situated in this conflict, who would have a capacity, if mixed and held together, to make things grow exponentially beyond their numbers? So to be the yeast, to make something really happen in, a, in an exponential way rather than an incremental way, which is often how we do things. He says we need an imaginative, mediative capacity. Well. Whatever it is, I think we're talking about conflict transformation as a team activity. It's a network activity. It's not an individual one, is it? I mean, and then I'm wondering, have we too easily taken an academic concept and turned it into an operational one and then discovered we can't do it? I am wondering if conflict transformation is too vague and broad a concept to be useful to us in an instrumental way as distinguished from a conceptual way of thinking about things. I think we may need to give more time and energy to thinking about the scope of conflict transformation in practice, the nature of the task and how such processes can be led and sustained. And I think in doing that, we need to revisit our values and see them upstream as well as downstream in those two contexts. And if we don't do this, I'm asking myself, how can we really claim to implement or evaluate conflict transformation at all? So I th in a way, I'm worried that we're setting ourselves up to lose all the time by a too complex model and too diffuse to effectively evaluate. So the people out there who fund us, for good or bad reasons, are right in saying, but it doesn't work, does it? So clarity, clarity there I think might help us. I'm going to end. In conclusion, I think our community, our movement, is doing great work in many ways in helping groups to resolve conflicts, rather as I've described, through mediation, negotiation, dialogue, and so on. Very difficult, they're not easy, and I think we are getting good at it. Cross-culturally, it's amazing what's happening. They are the tools of our trade, and we are developing cross-cultural approaches. It's very exciting. But I think we're less keen to engage in, and less good at working on the transformation of these conflicts at a deeper level for a significant change in attitudes, beliefs, values, relationships, culture and structure. And in ourselves, as well as in other people. I'm not sure how much we actually try to systematically transform conflicts. Though we use the term quite a lot. With notable exceptions, I think we are uneasy and rather less skilled in working low profile in intractable situations where there's unbalanced power and repression and where conflict transformation is most needed. 
I'm not clear how this relates to the upstream situation I've described. We may be dealing with different but linked phenomena. But I do think that these contradictions are seriously constraining our ability to break out with what we've got and, and somehow, somehow find a way of articulating our model into the big picture so that we do get a change in the way that states behave towards states and that the UN functions. I don't think it's that far away, but I do believe we're still not clear enough about what's, what we're trying to do. So we still have politicians who borrow this and borrow that when it suits them. I think we've got a, a, a much more far-reaching paradigm, but we're not quite there yet. So, as I'm into Sufi stories, I want to end with another one. Told to me by Hiskias Asefa, who some of us will know, a wise Ethiopian mediator and teacher, who did say to me the other day, you know, the more I'm in this field, the less I know. So I feel able to, to tell this story. And the story is this, from a young age, this is told by a mystic, from a young age, says the mystic, I was a revolutionary, and my prayer consisted of saying to God, Lord, give me strength to change the world. When I matured into an adult, and I realized that I'd passed through half my life without having changed even one soul, I altered my prayer, and I began to say, Lord, Give me grace to transform those who come into contact with me, even if this may only be my family and friends. Now that I am old, and my days are numbered, I realize how stupid I have been. My only prayer now is, Lord, give me grace to change myself. If I had prayed this way from the beginning, I would not have wasted my life that word again. Everyone attempts to change humanity. Almost no one thinks about changing oneself. Well, our movement is not yet old, but maybe it's time to pray his final prayer for ourselves. And as we do, perhaps the nice people, as I've described us, will get wiser and tougher. So I'm going to conclude by saying we're not actually wasting our time, I don't think, but we could be doing it a whole, using it a whole lot better than we are.